Me. Um, I'd love to hear about it. And so, you know, libraries collect information on all kinds of subjects. And um, just like in our collection, we like to have a diversity of points of view. So I encourage you to share your points of view and get involved with the conversation. Any more people coming in? Anyway, so this next week um, we have one of our faculty who teaches English here, Johnny, who will be talking about why why we need disturbing art. So that should be very interesting. And today it's my great pleasure to welcome Dowdy Abe. Um, he's going to introduce our speaker and. Um, Daddy is a humanities instructor here at the college, so please welcome Daddy. Thank you, thank you. So just very briefly, you know, I, as the son of an African immigrant, grew up playing soccer uh, yes, at a young age. Football. Yes. And um, can remember days in the 1970s when he would take me to go see the old Seattle Sounders when mm -hmm. uh, people like Pele would come to town and play in the Kingdom and, and that was big for a little while but then probably by the time the 80s came around the league that those old Sounders played in the NASL had fizzled and kind of died out. And there's always been this kind of conversation throughout the 80s and then throughout the 90s about okay well is soccer ready to make its big breakthrough in the U.S. and we have something sustainable. Uh, that can be the, a model that can, you know, not just be a flash in the pan, but can actually be around for a longer time. And so as we get to now, these later kind of in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, late 2000s, we start to see uh, a model that's developed here, right here in Seattle, um, within this new soccer league, this new American soccer league, uh, Major League Soccer, um, of a stadium that holds uh, over 60,000 people uh, that has a fan base that is just out of this world and it has embraced uh, this new edition of the Sounders uh, in a way that has really served as a role model for all of the other teams in Major League Soccer. Uh, not only that, but inter internationally people are looking at what's happening here as far as soccer goes in Seattle um, and taking tips away. Um, and so it's my pleasure to introduce somebody who can expound and give us a little bit of explanation as to how this came about and kind of some of the larger cultural ramifications uh, that such a successful soccer program has uh, in, in this greater Northwest area. Uh, so please uh, help me welcome my good friend and the author of Sounders FC, Authentic Masterpiece, which will be available as soon as we finish here, Mr. Mike Castano. <laughs> Uh, Downey, thanks. Thanks very much. This uh, we met four or five months ago for lunch, and we kind of had the genesis of this. I'm real excited to be here. And I'm, it's great to see a crowd. Um, I did a thing, and this is you, when you do something like this, you do a book, you put it out there, and sometimes people like it and they want to talk about it, and sometimes they don't. I did a thing with the King County Library System, and they were great. They they set me up, and I went into I was supposed to go into eight different libraries and, and give lectures like this. And the first three of them, we had a total of three people show up. So I'm thrilled to be in a library with some people in it and, uh, and, and get to talk a little bit, and I appreciate you coming out. The, the story really for this, I think more than anything, for the Sounders, is why Seattle? Why did this happen in Seattle? And what, we, what I mean by that is Major League Soccer as a league is, is very strong, is very healthy, most of the franchises are doing well, they all average about 20,000 fans per game. Most of their games are not necessarily televised. Uh, their merchandising is okay. It's growing. It's in a growth stage. Mm -hmm. And there's really one city where that has just, th that model has been completely broken, and it's here. Yeah. Here, the Sounders draw 45,000 people a game. Some games, they sell as many as 67,000 tickets. Uh, their merchandising is so ubiquitous that if we stood here at the window, I bet within two minutes we'd see somebody come by with a Sounders coat or a hat yes. or a scarf. Um, it's, it's an amazing story. How did it happen? Why did it happen in Seattle? And there are some specific reasons. Well, we'll do questions later, okay? Comments, not no, no. questions. No, we'll do that later, okay? okay. Hold on. Thanks. Um, 
Why did it happen here? And one of the reasons to get an answer as to why it happened here, interestingly enough, is to me is a fascinating story, and some of you may be familiar with it, but it has its roots in Barcelona, Spain, and a team called FC Barcelona, Football Club Barcelona. Now, Football Club Barcelona, like many clubs around the country, is incredibly powerful, incredibly strong within its community, and is tied to the community through more than just sports. It's tied to cultural boundaries, language boundaries, passion boundaries. It, it, it's just, it's in depth in the community. The reason for this, in part, A, it goes back like 250 years. The club was back 200 years. It was formed in the 1800s. But B, more important than that, is during the Spanish Civil War in the 30s, as, uh, as Franco, as the dictator Franco, rose to power, like most dictators, he had a good idea how he wanted to do things. His way, no other way. We were going to do things my way. Part of that was wiping out Catalan culture. Barcelona is in a region of Spain, the, the Catalan region. The Catalan is its own language. It's very similar to Spanish, but it's different. It has different, uh, uh, there's different words, different inflections. It's a different language. The culture is different. The food is different. The people are different. It is their, it's their own region. It's like regions of any country. Well, Franco wanted to wipe this out. He wanted everybody to be speaking Spanish and Spanish strictly. He wanted everybody to be doing things his way. And if you didn't comply, you were going to be in big trouble. So he forbid people in that part of the, the country from, from speaking the language or singing their songs, their patriotic songs. That, you, doing so on the street could get you arrested. The one thing that kind of held the community together during this time was football club Barcelona because it was already so big and so powerful that it was truly something that a dictator couldn't do anything about. When you've got tens of thousands of people coming together in a stadium and they want to sing a song, how are you going to stop that? They want to use their language. How are you going to stop that? Now, they tried to stop it within the team. They said, you can only uh, call your players by their Spanish names. If they have a Catalan name, you have to tell them to change it to a Spanish name. Mm -hmm. So they did things like that. They, um, they murdered the club president. The team president for FC Barcelona was murdered by, by Franco's uh, henchman. Joseph Sunyol was his name. Uh, Franco changed the name of the Copa del Rey. Copa del Rey is Spanish for the, uh, 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 the Sun Cup, for the Cup of Light. It's the cup that goes to the Spanish League champion every year. He changed the name of that to the Copa de Su Excelencia El Generalissimo. <laughs> meaning the Supreme General's Cup. He named it after himself. Uh, and an interesting story about the intimidation factor that a dictator can have. Took place in 1943 in the, I gotta read this again, Copa de Su Excelencia El Generalissimo. Barcelona, with its Catalan culture that was being suppressed, played Madrid. Now, Madrid was in Franco's town and they were all playing by the rules. They were right behind Franco and we're gonna be Spanish and we're gonna win the Spanish Civil War and we're gonna do what you want, Mr. Dictator. So they're playing, Madrid and, and Barcelona are playing in 1943, and they played what's called an aggregate goal match. If you know soccer, you know what that means. You play two matches, one in each city, and then you total up the goals at the end, and whoever has the most wins that championship. So they played first in Barcelona, and FC Barcelona won the match 3-0. Then they moved the match to Madrid a week later. Imagine this. If any of you have ever played sports, whether in high school, college, grade school, imagine if you were sitting in your locker room, you're getting ready to go out and play for the championship, and you're ahead three to nothing. And all of a sudden, one of the dictator, one of the general's henchmen, his head of security came in, uninvited, and told the team, you must realize you are only here and you're only going to leave here today by the uh, generosity of Franco's regime. He basically insinuated that if they won today, they weren't going to leave Madrid. Any, any guesses as to what the, the final score was? The Hollywood version, Barcelona would win. And they went out and lost 11 to 1. They were told they were going to be in trouble if they won, so they said, let's make sure we lose and let's lose big because I want to go home and see my family. I still want to live. So there's just a little background on it. We can go on and there are books and, and things you can look up about FC Barcelona and how important they were to the culture of that region uh, at that time. Barca, they survived. They were able to survive through the Civil War. And even in the 50s and 60s, when there was still a lot of political turmoil, they survived. And again, Catalan culture, 
it would be a stretch to say it stayed alive only because of FC Barcelona, but FC Barcelona was the biggest symbolic thing of how that culture stayed alive. And, and it meant a tremendous amount to the people, to the point that when Franco finally uh, was toppled in 73 and then died in 75 and Spain declared independence and had their first elections uh, in hundreds of years, one of the things that also happened uh, as a result of that is the Barcelona people said, you know what, now that we're free to practice uh, our language and, and to, to freely support FC Barcelona without government intervention, uh, the, the club actually said, we want you, the people, because you kept us alive during this time, we want you to govern our club. So Barcelona was among the first teams in the world to actually have a government that is done by their fans, by the people of Barcelona. They have tremendous power. They can vote out coaches, they can vote out general managers, team presidents. They have more power than any fan base in the world. And that was partially because the club looked at them and said, you kept us alive during these horrible times. We helped keep you alive during these horrible times. Let's continue to work together. And they work together to this day. Now, how does all this impact Seattle? Seattle has four owners of its Major League Soccer franchise. A guy named Joe Roth, who's a movie producer. A guy named Adrian Hanauer, who's a Seattle businessman. Uh, a gentleman named Paul Allen, who you're hopefully familiar with. And a gentleman named Drew Carey. The Drew Carey of Price is Right fame, and whose line is it anyway, and, uh, and the Drew Carey show. Drew is a partial owner of the Sounders. This happened because in 2007, he was hosting a show on the Travel Channel that allowed him to go anywhere in the world he wanted to learn things. And he ended up in Barcelona. He was learning about Barcelona culture. He had become a soccer fan, but he didn't know anything about FC Barcelona. He went and took a tour of their stadium and heard this amazing story about how it was so ingrained in the culture and how the fans had supported the team and the team supported the fans. And he thought to himself, you know, I'd like to do something like that in American sports. How come there's nothing like this in America where the fans govern the team? So he came back to Los Angeles and he looked into owning a major league soccer franchise. And he found out that A, he didn't he wasn't quite financially set to do that. And B, uh, uh, there really weren't any franchises available. There was an expansion franchise that was going to go to Seattle. But that horse was kind of out of the barn. They had their ownership group set. But he found out that one of the owners was Joe Roth, the movie producer in Los Angeles. Well, Drew happened to know him. So he contacted Joe and met with him and said, look, I would like to be a part of this ownership group, but on one condition. If, if I come in at just a small piece, I would like to bring the Barcelona model to an American sports franchise and allow their fans to have more power and create a system where the fans can really feel like they have power within the team. And Joe loved the idea. He had to run it by his partners. They all agreed this would be unique. This would be something that no other sports franchise has. The Sounders repeatedly during their gestation process took risks. They were willing to do things that nobody else was willing to do. And they loved the idea, and so they brought Drew in. One quick kind of sidebar. Did anybody ever watch The Price is Right? Anybody ever yeah, watch The Price is Right? You know the grocery game? You know the grocery game? Yes. Yeah. Here's a true story. Drew Carey, when he first contacted Joe Rudd, says, I want to meet with you and talk about being an owner of the team. And Joe's representative said, Joe has a lunch date available six weeks from tomorrow. And the myth of a Hollywood movie producer being busy is not a myth. They are busy and they're, they're rich and they're powerful and they go all over the place and so it takes a long time to get on their calendar. So now, Drew says, okay, great, I want to be on his calendar in six weeks. And Drew says he rehearsed for six weeks what he was going to say. The day he used to meet Joe for lunch was the last day of rehearsals for The Price is Right. Uh, Drew was taking over for Bob Barker, who had hosted that show for years and years and years. Now Drew was going to host the show. He's on the last day of rehearsals. It's in the morning. At noon that day, he's supposed to meet Joe for lunch. He's fooling around on stage. He's in a good mood. It's, they're finally getting ready to launch the show. And he's playing around with the prop they use for the grocery game where the board flips around. He kind of sticks. He said he's going to stick his hand in it and then act like his hand was stuck. Well, he stuck his hand in it at the exact same time the guy operating the remote control swung the thing around. So the board came around and fractured his arm. This is like... 10.30 in the morning, 11 in the morning. He's supposed to meet Joe at noon. He's, it's taken six weeks to get on the schedule. So the EMT shows up. And they said, well, you've got to go to the hospital. You have a fractured arm. And Drew says, I can't. I have a meeting with the most powerful man in Hollywood. Joe had run Fox. He had run uh, 20, uh, um, Warner Brothers. He'd run a couple of different films. But he was a very powerful guy. And 
Bruce says, I, I can't miss this meeting. So they pack his arm in ice, put it in a sling, and when he first met with Joe Roth and proposed this, he had water dripping off of his arm. They're sitting at some fancy Hollywood place, and he just looks a mess. But that's how passionate Drew was about wanting to get involved, but only if he could bring the Barcelona model to Seattle. So it may have taken me a little bit to get to this point, but the whole, one of the main primary reasons this has worked so well in Seattle, and so many people have become fans, and so many people buy tickets, is because of the implication or, or the implementation of something that Drew Carey called democracy in sports. He says, why can't we do this? Why can't we do the Barcelona model? Now, they weren't able to copy it completely. But what Drew was able to do, he says, look, why don't we do this? For starters, let's have a, a, a governing system that we'll call the alliance. Yes. Who can be in the alliance? Anyone. Anyone in, anyone in the world can be in the alliance. You have to either buy a season ticket, or if you don't want a season ticket or can't afford a season ticket, you pay like a $25 fee, and now you're in the alliance. You get to vote on things that affect the club, most notably a vote they hold every four years on the general manager, and there'll be more on that in a minute. But you, anyone, any one of us right now can go down and join. I'm in the alliance. I'm a season ticket holder. I get to vote on things if I want. Once you're in the alliance, you can then become a part of what's called the alliance council. The Alliance Council is a group right now of about 45 people. They have some special privileges. They meet directly with ownership three times a year. I don't know of any other team in America that has that kind of a system where they meet directly with their fans three times a year to hear any concerns. You have a concern about the stadium. You have a concern about parking. You have a concern about the uniforms or anything you want. We will meet with you and discuss it. And to get on the Alliance Council, all you have to do is be in the Alliance and then convince 25 other people in the Alliance to write a letter on your behalf. So again, it's very much, it, it is the perfect idea of democracy. If you can get enough people to say you are, are worthy of this honor, then presto, you're on the Alliance Council. Interesting story about the Alliance Council's first meeting. So they set this up, and all along there is the, you know, the overriding cynicism that we have in our society. Among the first, like, 15 people on the Alliance Council, they're like, you know, they're going to try and tell us what to do and tell us what to think. This is going to be symbolic. It's not going to be any more than that. So they, they hold their first meeting, and the sounders said, look, we'll let you use the conference room at our offices. And they were all going, oh, boy, what does this mean? They're going to they're probably sit and watch us and not let us do what we want. Good. And they got everybody in, and they got ready to start the meeting. And it was represented from the sounders. And they said, okay, we have one condition that they played a great joke on. We have one condition. If you don't meet this condition, you, we're not going to have an alliance council and you can't have the meeting. And they're all like, here we go. Told you, this is all a big ruse. They said, okay, what's the condition? And the guy in the sounder says, when you're done tonight, whenever it is, turn out the lights. And no. from that moment on, the alliance council felt they, they kind of, they get us. They, they want us to have power. The alliance council has created their own charter, their own constitution, their own bylaws. Uh, they meet with the owners, as I said, three times a year. Joe Roth has said, he's told me in the book, he says, look, we will consider any suggestion they have that doesn't financially impact us in a negative way. But any other thing that they want to do, we'll consider the suggestion. The, the vote I told you about, and not only the Alliance Council, but everybody in the Alliance has this, is every four years they get to vote on the fate of the general manager of the team. The only only uh, sport in North America, only team in North America that does that. If the general manager is doing a lousy job, they can vote him out. Even better than that, if the general manager is doing a lousy job right now and they get a certain percentage of people within the alliance to have a recall election, they will have the recall election. The team agreed to this. was their idea, and the team agreed to it. Yeah, that's fine. We'll, we'll agree with that. And so, you know, they, they get to sit down and say, okay, we think he's doing a good job, and if he's not, let's get him out and let's get somebody else in. And at first it kind of seems like, okay, well, yeah, but so what? What does that mean? But there was a method to this that, that to me was really impressive. And Drew Carey explained it to me in the book. He says, we think that by doing this, he says, the number one problem that faces sports teams is when they start losing, fans say, nah, to hell with it. I'm not going to the game. Nah, I hate that team. They're lousy. He says, we feel that if we tell our people, look, if you're upset, vote the general manager out. And instead of saying, we're not going to the game, they're going to say, hey, let's get together. We need to hold a meeting, and we need to hold this guy accountable. Whether it will work or not, we don't know. They've had one election. The general manager kept his job, partially because they've won since day one. They've had great success on the field. But someday, there'll come a day where they vote a general manager out. I think that's one of the huge things. They created this thing, democracy in sport, 
and they really lived up to it. They created a, a, a program and then allowed the people to govern themselves, to create their own constitution, how they want to govern things. Uh, again, they can vote on uniforms, they can vote on the various merchandise that the team does. They're allowing them now to vote on the charities that the team supports. Yeah. A lot of it may seem small. I mean, they don't get to vote on the day-to-day -day direction of the team, but they get more input into their club and they can feel more ownership into their club than any other group of fans in America. And it's one of the reasons it's worked so well here. Recently, the Sounders announced that they're starting a minor league team. This minor league team, when they announced it, they, they made an announcement again, never done in American sports before, but it's an offshoot of this. They said, we are going to take 20% of the ownership at our cost, and we're giving it to the Seattle fans. And to be an owner of the team, you had to be one of the first 750 people to sign up to buy tickets. I mean, so they, they're benefiting from it a little bit, but they're saying, rather than just say buy tickets and come to the game, hey, buy tickets and be an owner. And those people are going to have uh, a chance to elect people to the team's board and hold them responsible. So on and on, they have really ingrained themselves. And this all goes back to Drew Carey going to Barcelona in 2007, taking a tour of a stadium. I took the same tour when I was there in 2004, I think. And, and, and just learning about this, well, why couldn't we do this in America? And the result is what we see here. Now, another thing that was kind of an offshoot of this was a decision the Sounders ownership made to engage and empower the Emerald City supporters. The Emerald City supporters, or ECS, the group of supporters who sit in the uh, south end zone at the games. If you've ever been to a match, you've seen them. They, they bounce around, they jump up and down, they sing, they dance, they wave flags. They're an incredible support group. Well, this is, again, taken from clubs around the world. Every club around the world has a supporters group. Some are strong, some are weak, some are good, some aren't so good. This one tried to take all the good things and, and, and put them in there. So they were a small group in 2008 when this franchise was getting ready to start. But they wanted to take a little ownership and, a, and, and help guide the team in the direction of how the team could be supported. So they wanted to meet with the Sounders. And the Sounders, you know, it's interesting because it's really polar opposites. The Sounders, at their core, even though we talk about democracy and sport and everything, the Sounders are buttoned down, coat and tie wearing business people. You know, they're, they're, they're in the boardrooms. They're making six and seven and eight figure deals. They've got a huge, huge investment on the line here. The Emerald City supporters are a bunch of beer-drinking, rowdy maniacs. You know, they couldn't have come from further apart, but they had soccer out in the middle in common. And the biggest thing the Sounders did in terms of uh, the Emerald City supporters was to take them seriously, engage them, and empower them. And the biggest thing the Emerald City supporters did was the exact same thing. They took the Sounders seriously. When they had meetings, they showed up dressed for a business meeting. They showed up on time. They had an agenda. They had things they wanted to talk about. The Sounders, for their point, and a lot of teams in Major League Soccer met with their supporters groups and did, did the exact thing that the Sounders did. The Sounders resisted the urge to sit in a meeting, listen to everybody, and then go, okay, thanks for your input, and we'll see you later. They engaged them. They said, well, why do you want to do that? Is that feasible? Can we do this? Can we, can we for example, can we put 4,000 people in general admission seats in an American sports stadium? Nobody does that. Everybody has a seat. You buy a seat, that's a ticket, you go and you sit in that seat. The supporters said, look, for us to be a true supporters group, it has to be general admission. The tickets have to be cheap. Because everybody, in theory, and this is something that's worldwide with soccer supporter groups, the seats are always cheap so that anyone can join the supporters if they want to. The finances should not be a barrier. Uh, so they, they kept working through these things. Uh, the Emerald City supporters, about the third meeting they had, showed the Sounders, hey, here's our charter that we've drawn up. Here's how we're going to govern ourselves. They have three presidents. They have a, a treasurer. Uh, they have a, a travel coordinator. They have a security detail. The Sounders said, what's that? And he says, well, what we want to do, we want to be our own security in matches. And we'll work with your guys. But if one of our guys is being an idiot, has had too much to drink or is being profane or stupid, let us go talk. Give us a chance to talk to him and straighten him out. And if we can't, then have that. But give us a chance. And the Sounders said, yeah, you know what? Okay. And they agreed to trust them. And to this point, it's worked. And, and the, uh, Aaron Reed, who's one of the co-presidents, gave me a, a great, great line in the book about that. I said, why'd you guys do that? Why do you care? 
why don't, why don't you let stadium security handle idiots? And he goes, because this thing we're building is so important to us, we're not going to let the selfish actions of a fool ruin it for everybody. And the team heard this guy and said, they go, These, this is different. This is different than just a group of fans asking for power. They're really serious about this. So, you know, again, the continued engagement, both sides took each other seriously. Um, and because they did this, here's a big key to why the Sounders were successful. Because they sat down and met with the Emerald City supporters and listened to them. And they said, hey, we want to we wanna do our own songs. We don't want you to put anything on the scoreboard that tells anybody what to say. We'll teach people what to say. We'll teach them the songs. And, and the sounds thing, okay, this is great. You know, and they trusted them to create this environment that was created on opening night and maintains to this day. Now, they have their differences. The Sounders wish that the Emerald City supporters would not use as much profanity as they use in their chants. And the Emerald City supporters have tried, and they will do our best. Uh, but it's, you know, it, those are small things. Uh, the Emerald City supporters wanted to bring uh, smoke bombs into the stadium. I've never quite understood this, but around the world, when soccer teams score goals, a lot of times they shoot off smoke bombs in the stadium, which of course waters your eyes and blocks the view. Of, but the, the supporters groups like doing that. The Sounders said, you can't do that. That's against the law here. It's against the fire marshal will take us out. We can't do it. So they said, what if we shoot our smoke bombs off in the street? And the Sounders said, that's not our problem. Shoot them off in the street if you want. So they shoot them off in the street okay. when they're marching in. Uh, the Sounders, because they engaged, and because they were smart, and they created this democracy thing, they kind of stumbled into a situation that gave them a huge advantage over most professional sports teams. Before they ever played, this is all stuff before they ever played the game. They kind of knew who their fans were. They had an idea of who their fans were, what they looked like, what they were into. And this gave them a huge advantage as they started it. Three quick stories about their interactions with the Emerald City supporters to, to kind of give you an example of how serious the Sounders have taken this covenant that they've created with the ECS. And again, they don't always see eye to eye, but they really respect one another. Three quick stories. So we all know about the march to the match. You've seen that, right, where thousands of fans gather in Occidental Park and then march down to the stadium. This was patterned off of similar things around the world. Its origins in Seattle actually go back to about 2006 when the Sounders were a minor league team drawing 1,000 people. And at that point, it wasn't the Emerald City supporters. It was a group, I think it was called Soundwave. I forget the name of it. It was a smaller group, about 30 guys. They would get together in a bar, and then the 30 of them would march into the match together. It didn't quite have the impact of thousands, but they did this. And they sang songs and waved flags, and they had a fun time. Well, as they start to see things grow, and they, they all start to sense how big the MLS could be, they said, look, uh, they met with the uh, sound company, and they said, we have something we'd like to tell you about that maybe you guys, you know, we want to work together, right? Well, here's an idea we have that maybe you guys could take and run with. We want to do this march to the match thing. We want to meet in the bars around Occidental Square and then come out and sing some songs and then march down together as one. Well, the Sounders loved the idea. They saw it and said, this is going to be great. So the Sounders set up a stage, and they bring players down occasionally, and the ownership group comes down. They have the band there, and it's a real fun thing. Well, it got bigger. They all kind of thought, all right, this is going to be a few hundred people. Well, on opening night, it was something like 3,000. And for some of the Portland games, it's been as many as 5,000. It's become a huge deal. So the Sounders took a look at this, and they did exactly what pro sports teams do when they have something grow like that. They sold a sponsorship to it. They went to Budweiser and said, hey, why don't you give us some money and we'll call this the Budweiser March to the Match. Yeah. This is a great idea, right? The Sounders make a little money, Budweiser gets some exposure. Guess who didn't think it was such a great idea? The Emerald City supporters. They, they hold true to these core values of purity. It's, I always describe the Emerald City supporters. I tell them, I said, you guys are like the 1950s never ended in this country. There's an innocence to them. There's a purity. They just want, you know, we don't want sponsorship with the Emerald City supporters. We can't have a sponsor on our thing. So they have the Budweiser March to the Match banners. The next week, the Emerald City supporters said, we need to meet with you. Well, again, the Sounders, unlike most pro sports teams, didn't say, well, we'll meet with you here in a few months. They said, no, let, let's meet. So they met that week. And the ECS said, look, this was our idea. We gave it to you. It's organic. There's a purity to it. We want to participate in it, but if it's the Budweiser March of the Match, we're out. And we're going to tell all the other fans to be out, too. You can't take our idea that we gave you and put a sponsor on it. Now, again, most sports teams are not about to throw away revenue. 
And most sports teams, I think, would have said, well, you know what, we're going to have to agree to disagree on this because this is a big deal now and we have to put Budweiser on there. Mm -hmm. The Sounders said to them, okay, thank you, we're going we're gonna to take this into consideration. And then they met and they said, you know what, they're right. This was their deal. We've kind of taken it and stolen it from them. We can't put a name on it. So they told them no, and they, they told Budweiser, we're going to take your names off of it. And it went back to just being the Sounders' march to the match. But they still This is things that, that I, I, I don't ever, ever see that happening anywhere else. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. Another story. The, uh, uh, this year, this is, a, this is a, a, a really interesting story about how the two groups work together and how they don't always reach the same end. So the San Jose Earthquake, uh, the, there's a new stadium in Santa Clara, California. The San Jose Earthquake was going to play the first match in this new stadium. The big 60,000 seat NFL stadium that the 49ers are going to use, but they wanted to have a soccer match in there first. So San Jose is going to play Seattle. And San Jose, about two months before the game, announces that the tickets that they normally reserve for the visiting team supporters group are going to be three times what the normal cost is. Now they did this for one reason, because it was Seattle, because they knew Seattle fans traveled. Yeah. It was an absolute naked cash grab. And the supporters group, the Emerald City supporters, did something that they had never done in the six year history of the team. They announced that they are suggesting to all supporters that you do not travel to this game. That this is a game we're going to miss. For the first time ever, we're not going to travel here. These guys, the supporters have traveled to El Salvador, to South America. There has always been an Emerald City supporters group Sometimes as few as 10 people, but there's always been a group at every match the Sounders have ever played. But in the San Jose case, or, you know what, we're not going to, this is naked greed here, and we're not buying it. And so, this, and so it was. Well, the Sounders ownership group, led by Adrian Hanauer, saw this, and they were very impressed by it. But they also love having their fans at matches. So they met with the ECS, the, the, the people who run the ECS. And they said, look, we think this is awesome. We pledge to you, we'll never do this to a visiting team. We'll never take the tickets and jack them up. We'll be fair. We're going to work with San Jose to try and get them to stop this. But meanwhile, we want you to go to the match. So you pay what they were going to charge you. We'll pay the difference on every ticket. It's a tremendous offer. Unbelievable. Unprecedented offer. We're going to pay our fans to go to a game. The Emerald City supporters said, that's great. We're going to meet and talk about it. They came back a week later and said, you know what? That's a great offer, and we're not going to accept it because we want to be independent of you. We don't want to be beholden to you for anything. We appreciate the generosity of it. And that, again, to me, that's, it's just amazing to watch these two. And we kind of go back to the theme. Why does this happen in Seattle? It's because time and time again, when confronted with a potential wrong decision, people often have made the right. Finally, the U.S. Open Cup trophy story. And this is, again, a story I've never heard of in any other sports situation. So the U.S. Open Cup is like the, uh, here, let me, get the, let me get the name here. I don't want to get Franco mad at me. It's the U.S. version of the Copa de Su Excelencia El Generalissimo, the U.S. Open Cup. It goes back well over 100 years, and it's for all teams in America to play, and at the end of it, you get the U.S. Open Cup, a beautiful silver trophy. The Sounders have been very, very good at it. In fact, they've won it four times. The last time they won it was last month, in September, in Philadelphia. The Emerald City supporters brought a huge contingent, three or 400 people went to Philadelphia to, to root this thing on, and as luck would have it, uh, the Sounders were scheduled to play a game in New York four days later, so many of the ECS supporters went to Philadelphia, and then we're going to go up to New York and make a week out of it, have a nice vacation, see two road matches. So they're in Philadelphia, the Sounders win, it's a dramatic victory, it's just thrilling, everybody's having a great time. They leave the stadium area and go back into downtown where everyone was staying. The Sounders have a party going at their hotel, and Adrian Hanauer, the owner, comes in, and he, he comes to the party and says, hey guys, because I was walking back up here, and the supporters are having a party two blocks away at a bar. And I think it'd be cool if we went down there. And so Adrian and the coaching staff and about a half a dozen players and the trophy went down to this dive bar where the Emerald City supporters have taken over and are drinking beer and singing their songs, and in come the Sounders. Well, the place goes nuts. And I tell you, went nuts as well. The owner of the bar was here. I don't even know who you guys are, but thanks for being here. So they get there. And they're, they're just having this incredible celebration, and the, the supporters are amazed that some of their heroes are there, and they can't believe there's the Open Cup. And Ziggy Schmidt, the coach, stands up with the Open Cup, and he says, look, you know, we won this, but this belongs to you. The club belongs to you guys. So what we've decided to do is take this trophy. We're going to give it to you guys tonight in the bar. You 
you guys take it around Philadelphia, take it up to New York, have a good time, get your picture taken with it, do it, and then give it back to us after New York and we'll fly it back on the team plane. I, the San Francisco Giants won the World Series last night. I doubt very seriously they took that trophy and gave it to their fans and said, hey, have a fun time with it. The amount of trust, the amount of mutual respect, and the Sounders, the Emerald City supporters took the trophy, they took pictures of it all over Philadelphia. They had it on the train. They bought it its own seat for the train. They all were drinking. And they took it to New York. And they had it sitting at the game in New York. And afterwards, they met with the team and gave it back to them. It's in, it's in mint condition. It's an amazing story. And it again gets back to the whole idea of democracy and sport, trusting your fans and trusting one another. Uh, one last thing I'll talk about real quick for why this worked and how the idea that they engage with their fans is more than just a phrase. The, and, and I'm not sure how many of you are from Seattle. So you know that the, the Sounders, as, as you know, old guys like Dr. Abi and I know, the Sounders go back to the 70s and the NASL. That name goes back there. And they were a minor league team for years. Well, when they're getting ready to go into Major League Soccer, Everybody. there were some obvious reasons to call them the Sounders, to play into the city's history, uh, to play into the, the, the name, and people love the name and they know it. There are some reasons not to call them the Sounders either. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the idea of branding. But most people will tell you, hey, when well, you're getting ready to go into something new, you're getting ready to go into Major League Soccer, this is new, we need a new brand, we need a new name. We can't call them the Sounders, that's a name affiliated with a team that went out of business. It's a name affiliated with a minor league team, you don't want to have that with your new flashy brand and everything, no way. Well, interestingly enough, so the league was against them being called the Sounders. Within the Sounders organization, there were people that agreed with the league. said, so, you know, that, that's not the dumbest idea ever, is to start over and have a new name and not be connected with the past. And there were others that said, no, we need to stay with our past. This is very important. So they discussed it and discussed it. As they were discussing it, they noticed on the internet, uh, among you know, chat rooms and comment message boards and things, a rising tide of anger. This is in early 2008. This is a year and a half before they were playing a game. Rising tide of anger from people saying, hey, they're not going to call them the Sounders. And other people are saying, you know, if they don't call them the Sounders, they'll never get a nickel of my money. I'll never go see a team play that's not called the Sounders. And they start looking at this. And again, rather than dismissing it, it goes, ah, oh, you guys are lunatics. They'll come see us no matter what we're called. They said, hey, we better pay attention to this. So they went to Major League Soccer. Major League Soccer said, forget it. You're not getting called the Sounders. Here are the three names we've picked for you. These are the three names Major League Soccer came up with. The Seattle Republic, the Seattle Alliance, and FC Seattle. So these were the three names. Yeah, right. And the Sounders said, okay, that's great. What we want to have is a name the team contest. So we're going to put those three names on. Then let us have a right in vote just to humor our fans. And the uh, League said, yeah, okay, that's fine. The League didn't know about all the stuff that the Sounders knew. So they put that out. The write-in vote garnered 82% of the vote. I'd like to meet the 18% that voted for Seattle Republic or Alliance, because I don't know where the heck they were coming from. But 82% of people said Sounders. Mm -hmm. And again, where this becomes important, and this is something to think about in your own life as you move forward and you get out into the business world of interacting with people and paying attention to stuff. The Sounders could have taken this information and said, well, this is really cool. We're going to be called the Sounders because our fans voted for it which was all true, but then they went another step forward and said, now wait a minute, if our fans are this engaged 18 months before we play a game, if they're this passionate, we've got to start working with them. In some ways, I could have told this story first because that is the genesis of a lot of their wanting to work with the fans. They said, look, they're engaged. they love us already. We haven't even played, we're not playing a game until 2009, but they love us enough that they really forced this vote. And then they backed it up, rather than just forcing it and then saying, well, we'll see what happens. They rallied the troops to make sure that the vote went in favor of the Sounders. So it's, you know, again and again, there are these instances in the book where the idea of democracy in sports was more than just a phrase. It was something that was actually used and talked about and done again and again and again. And it's kind of interesting because uh, the fact that the Seahawks won the Super Bowl last year, and are this amazing, phenomenal team that we all love, the Seahawks wouldn't be in Seattle if it wasn't for soccer. And this gets into politics again, and here's why. In 1997, a gentleman named Ken Berry owned the Seahawks. He didn't like Seattle, he wanted to do business up here, but he, he was a land developer, and he kind of made some mistakes, and people didn't like him, so he's like, I'm going to take your football team. 
I'm going to take that team away. And he wanted to move them to Anaheim, California. Well, the NFL prevented him. He wanted, he wanted to do this because he said he was afraid of earthquakes. So he wanted to move from Seattle to Southern California because he was afraid wow. of earthquakes. Well, the NFL kind of laughed him right out of the room. So yeah. you can't do that. You have a lease. You have to fill out this lease in Seattle. Um, so he went back to Seattle. And he, and he says, look, I don't want to own the team up here, so I'll put it up for sale. One guy agreed to buy it. It was Paul Allen. Paul Allen agreed to buy it on one condition. He says, you know what? I don't like the Kingo either. So I'll pay for half of the new stadium. you got to pay for the other half of the new stadium. I'll do this one time. We'll vote on it once. If you vote to do it, we're in, and I'll save the Seahawks. If you vote not to, I'm stepping away. And Ken Baring said, if that happens, I'm declaring bankruptcy, and then the league can't prevent me from moving the team. So an election is held in the summer of 97 on whether or not we should build a new football stadium. In the spring of 97, all the polls are trending about 60% against. People are against taxing themselves to build a new stadium. It's not going to happen. The Seahawks are going to leave. A guy named Fred Mendoza was one of the biggest heroes in Seattle sports. And Fred is somebody nobody knows. He's a lawyer. He's a really, really nice guy. Fred Mendoza went and met with Paul Allen's people and said, look, I'm a huge soccer guy. And I'm a grassroots soccer guy. I know the community. If you guys will say you're willing to build the stadium to soccer specifications, with, with rounded corners instead of square corners, with sight lines that are also designed for soccer. If you're willing to do that, I'll rally soccer people and vote for it. He was three minutes into his pitch with Paul Allen when, when Paul's number one lieutenant, Bert Colt, said, this is a great idea. We're in. We'll do it. Because they knew there were 300,000 adults registered in soccer leagues around the state. Fred Mendoza then spent every day for three months going from county to county to county. This was a statewide vote, meeting with soccer people and convincing them, look, they've given me their word. I trust them. They're going to build for soccer, and then they're going to help us get a soccer team. When the vote finally came down, 51% of the people in the state voted. So just barely half the people voted. And less than 51% voted to build the stadium. Without soccer, there's no way that stadium gets built. And, and, and then, again, it's hard to say with absolute certainty, but there's a pretty good chance the Seahawks leave Seattle and the Anaheim Seahawks win the Super Bowl last year. And you don't think that can happen? Watch so the Oklahoma like City Thunder here. some night and remember, remember like who they here. used to be. Yeah. So it's appropriate that there is so much of an engagement in the community because part of this, and part of the reason the Seahawks and Paul Allen got involved in the ownership group way back at the start, was they, Paul Allen, owns 25% of the Sounders. He's been to exactly zero games. He made no bones about it. I, I don't like soccer. I don't care for soccer. However, mm -hmm. I want to help because these people helped us get this stadium. We told him we'd help him when the time came. And when the time finally came, Paul was a man of his word. And helped and stepped in and gave, his, uh, gave the Seahawks expertise to the Sounders, which helped them launch uh, as well. So again, when we talk about democracy in sports, it's not just the people who are really 100% fully involved with the Sounders and the MLT supporters and, and the fans. It's also just on the street. The actual vote to build that stadium came from soccer. A lot of soccer fans who've never joined the Emerald City supporters and probably didn't care what the team was called and wasn't all that, and they don't care what the colors of the uniform are and that. They just like the sport. But they voted to do that because they knew Fred Mendoza, and if Fred said it was going to be a good deal, it was going to be a good deal. There's a, a, a lot of reasons why this works so well in Seattle. But the primary one was because of the engagement of fans and because of a willingness to take a phrase like democracy in sports and make it more than just a phrase. And that's why what I say about my book is this is not a book about soccer. This is a book about business and culture and timing and luck and democracy and people putting their ego aside and doing what's right for the greater good. And that's really why it works so well uh, in this city. So I appreciate you listening to the thing. I've got, uh, uh, I'll, I'll do a half price deal on the book since you're all college people. And believe it or not, it hasn't been that long since I was in college. I guess it has been now. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'd be happy to do that for you if you're interested in buying it. If you don't have, if you don't want to buy it today and you want to buy it down the road, it's available through Amazon. It's available on Kindle. Uh, and uh, I, I think you'd like it. And of all these other books up here, if you're interested in this kind of a story about how soccer can get ingrained in a community, this book tells the story in Seattle. Uh, of all of these books, this is the one I'd recommend primarily because it's the one of these five that I've read. But <laughs> this is terrific. You'll read this in a, in a night or in an airplane flight. It's a real quick read. 
how soccer explains the world. It's about 16 different stories of soccer uh, uh, involving politics, soccer involving ethnicity, soccer involving riots, soccer involving religion, and how around the world, because in most countries it's the only sport, it is really a huge cultural impact. So I, uh, in addition to this fine book, I'd recommend this one as well for you to check out. So I think I went a little long, but we've got a few minutes for questions if anybody's got a question as I was rambling on there. Now, this is a surprise. I would have guessed anybody else but you would have the first question. I'm very surprised. What time did you get up this morning? Stay up. You stay up? I'm going to hang out with you after this. What's your question? Um, anybody else? You've got a question. Anybody got a question about this? There you go. I have a question. Has, has the Seattle soccer culture gone bled over to any of the other leagues? Great question. You know, the Seahawks actually created their own fan alliance last year. Now, the Seahawks and the Sounders have since split amicably, but the, the way I put it is the Sounders are like a 21-year-old kid that had a job. Time for them to get out of the house and be on their own. Uh, the Seahawks, though, have created their own alliance, and they are taking some of the things that the Sounders have done. They haven't gone quite to the extent the Sounders have. Uh, Portland is trying to do it with their team a little bit. Uh, it is not been, it's funny because everybody looks at the Seattle thing and says, this is amazing, and yet nobody seems to want to copy it. All right, you got yours? Do you have any of your uh, books in libraries you I think they're, I don't know if they've, they've got the book here or not in the library. I'm not sure. I think they're 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 right. I, think I ordered it. Yeah. I know King County Library has copies of it, yeah. I yeah. wait for a school. Too. Yeah. yeah. Sir? So you told the story about how the team forced a uh, team to lose. Uh, how did, at, at that time, was, was, was it big enough for other teams to challenge it like that? And if so, why would, why would they accept to play that kind of match? I, I, I think, the, it I, I think it's, it's what you just said there. It wasn't big enough. You know, information didn't flow near as freely, especially when a dictator's involved. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. And they were able to, to set up a situation. And again, it wasn't like they came in and said, we're going to kill you if you win this game. They came in and said, you know, the guys figured it out. You're here because of the generosity of uh, General Franco and the regime. And they're like, all right, guys, I think I know what he's saying here. So, you know, I mean, it's interesting if, if you're familiar with the, that Spain during that time. You know, uh, Picasso, the artist, the great painting during yes. is about a, a massacre that happened. And mm -hmm. most people in the world in the 40s found out about this massacre of Spanish civilians because of this painting. That he did. Think about that in this day and age where you know, Twitter, everything's happening right in front of us and, and, and the news feed so fast. Back then it was a painting is how the word got out about something. So I think you hit it early is that nobody knew about it. They didn't know about it. I mean, they knew about it, but it, not, it, not fast that, enough. Yeah. I think time-wise, we're just up against it. However, I think we should point out that the playoffs are starting. A, the playoffs are starting, and B, the, the Sounders not win the supporter shield. They, they did. You know, this is another thing, and part of this, I probably shouldn't gloss over this. The Sounders have worked so well because they've been good from the very start. People like supporting a winner. We still don't know what will happen to the support if the Sounders have a crummy year. Maybe we never will. That'd be awesome. But six years, they're the first franchise in American history to make the playoffs six consecutive years in their first six years of, of business, if that makes sense. And Dowdy's right, they just won the Supporters Shield, which goes to the top team in the league. Now they're in the playoffs. They start in Dallas on Sunday night. They've got an aggregate match against Dallas, so we will get Generalissimo to come in. If they, if they blow it down in Dallas, we'll tell FC Dallas they're not allowed to leave SeaTac unless they kick the game to us. Uh, but the playoffs will be in November. There are, if, if, and I, if, is there anybody who's never been to a Sounders game? There are tickets available, and I'll tell you, it's an experience unlike anything you've ever seen. It really is an amazing experience. But I want to go. I've been yeah. So I'm wondering if uh, with the new Sounders team, I'm curious as your thoughts as to like, because if, if one of the Edmonton season ticket over from the last council, part of the Royal FC, one of the other supporters. Did I get most of this right? Yeah, yeah, no. It's All right, good. I just, but I'm curious as to your thoughts on like, ways in which, uh, now that they have like the Sounders 2 and they're out in Tukwila, ways to kind of engage more of the community that, that lives out there and kind of like, 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 ways in which they can kind of like engage the communities that live out there that aren't necessarily always reflective at the games, like, you know, socioeconomic status and whatnot. No. 
you, you hit on it there. It took you a while to get to it. But so yeah. what they're going to be able to do with Sounders too is make the tickets even cheaper. So you're, it's, it's like a minor league baseball yeah. team. There are people that will say, hey, I can't, then, I can't afford it. Can you please be quiet for just a minute? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are people that won't go to a Mariners game and say, yeah, I can't afford a Mariners ticket, but those same people might go to a Tacoma Rainiers game because the tickets are about a third the cost, or an Everett Aquasas game because the tickets are cheap there too. That's part of what they're doing with this. It's very self-serving. They're going to feather their own nest. They're going to find players and develop them, but they're also going to be able to say to fans, look, if, look, if you go to a Saturday game and buy a club seat, two club seats, and you pay to park, and you have dinner beforehand, you have a couple of beers, you're looking at a couple hundred bucks by the end of the night. They're going to be able to say to fans, look, we understand not everybody can do that. So, and, they, and, and not every ticket, that's a club seat, that's the top price seat in the Sounders game. There are seats, I think my seats are $20, so there are cheaper seats. With the minor league game, they'll be even cheaper still. And they will be able to grow new fans. People, you know, example, uh, people who are in college. So it's like, okay, look, I don't have the money to go to post point events, but I can hop on the train, ride down to Tuck Willa, go to this match for a couple, three bucks, have a beer, have the same fun experience, and have a great time. And then, as I go out of college, I get my job and start having, I got some money now, now I can afford to go to the bigger things. So yeah, that's a big reason why they're doing it. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering, has, has soccer, it seems like uh, Seattle has had more effect on soccer than soccer's had on Seattle. I don't know, it's a great question. Certainly, both why. sides are true. <laughs> Certainly, but both of them. Because that know? culture of the fans mm -hmm. really affected the commercial aspects mm -hmm. of the team. Mm -hmm. You love Seattle, you know Seattle best place for soccer. That has nothing to do with it. Um, yes, the, um, the, the impact that Seattle has had on soccer has been more and more teams looking at them and saying, how can we do this now? How can we adopt this kind of a European model and make it work? The impact that the sports had on Seattle, it's amazing. I mean, this didn't exist six years ago. There's, there's a thousands of people going oh, yeah. in matches. It's, both sides are, are very strong. Yeah, it is. It's, it's amazing. Thank you for coming. Books watch the game. Buy the book. Ten dollars if you want to buy one here. Ten dollars for buying the books. Watch the game, and we'll see you. I'm not about this one. Maybe we'll do a.